when I'm in upstate New York and traveling through the Mohawk Valley, I'm always struck by how beautiful it is. Such a vast, open, lush place. You follow the river as it winds through small towns in the city of Amsterdam, and you're struck with a sense of the promise of such a place. The history of the Mohawk Valley is cities and towns that were once manufacturing and production world capitals thanks to the Erie Canal. And the Mohawk Valley, and specifically the Mohawk Valley Brownfields Developer Summit, is going to be the subject of today's 312 podcast. This episode is going to bring you the voices of those who were speaking and in attendance at the summit. We're going to hear from a lot of people today. And one theme that you'll hear throughout is the idea that we are stronger together. This is a theme that came through so clearly when you got to be in attendance there. And we're hoping that when you're done listening today, you'll feel the same way. As you'll know if you've seen our accompanying YouTube video, HRP's New York office was instrumental in the planning committee for the Mohawk Valley Developers Summit. Here's one of those planning committee members now, Ron Peters, from the Fulton County Center for Regional Growth. So you all know this is an organically grown event, with all of our six counties pulling together to make this event happen and to also recognize our needs as a region, which is trying to get brownfields up and running, get them back in good productivity, and create economic development opportunities. So this is a six county regional basis event. Those uh, six counties being Herkimer, Oneida, Schoharie, Montgomery, Fulton, and Ostego. Hello everybody, I'm Steve Smith, Executive Director of the Mohawk Valley Economic Development District. We're proud to be one of the sponsors and one of the groups that is spearheading this Brownfields Developer Summit here at Fulton Montgomery Community College. It's bringing together all of the developers who are especially interested in brownfields. Every community, every county has multiple sites of real estate that are contaminated and we're trying to bring in special developers that are interested in those properties to help redevelop them, hire people, get things back going again as far as industry, whether it be retail, commercial, or manufacturing. Okay, before we get any farther, let's hear what a brownfield actually is from Robert Smolin, representative of the 118th District of the New York State Assembly. The term brownfield site means real property, the expansion, redevelopment, or reuse, which may be complicated by the presence or potential presence of a hazardous substance, pollutant, or contaminant. Cleaning up and reinvesting in these properties protects the environment, reduces blight, and takes development pressures off green spaces and working lands. This definition is found in federal public law 107-118, Small Business Liability Relief in Brownfields Revitalization of Act of 2002. Okay, so to the letter, that is what a brownfield site is. For me and you, a brownfield site is probably something more akin to the big abandoned mill building in your town that seems to just be taking up space, that neglected property that's probably a hazard to everyone's health and well-being. Um, you've got quite a few of them in your community if the yours is anything like the one I live in in rural Connecticut or in the cases we're about to hear about upstate New York. Our towns and cities are littered with contaminated lands and environmental hazards created generations ago. The sites we'll learn about today and tomorrow represent our economic future going forward and that is the reason this Brownfield uh, Developer Summit is being held. The panelists you will hear from have dedicated themselves, their municipal resources, and the efforts of many in an attempt to position their sites for more productive uses. Not only are we cleaning up environmental and unhealthful conditions, but we are also presenting the opportunity for job creation and increased business operations, whether that is commercial or residential, and it seems to be working. That was Jack Spaeth, who is the Economic Development Program Specialist for the City of Utica and the Executive Director of Utica's Industrial Development Agency. From there, we're going to take you to a little bit about the sites that we heard about during the summit. Uh, one of the projects that I'm going to feature, uh, believe it or not, Herkimer County is a small county, but we do have several large brown fields and, and several uh, large investments that we've made over the few years. Uh, the feature property today, Charlestown. One of the first outlet stores actually, actually Savage Arms, a gun manufacturer was there. They're now in Springfield, Mass. Uh, Sperry Univac, one of the first computer companies was based out of there. And then it turned into a mall when those were big in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. 
And now it's transformed into what you see here today, which is very difficult to look at, especially since it sits on both the Oneida and Herkimer County lines. Um, we see it as a gateway to our communities and we're working together to try to clean this up. We have uh, Site 5, which is 420 Harbor Way, which is a 2.2 acre parcel. The site is adjacent to the navigation center that was built in Rome, as well as the new Hamilton Boathouse from Hamilton College, which will be opening this weekend. So if you're in the area, check it out. Um, this was the former General Cable Corporation manufacturing site. And the environmental conditions of this site, it's been remediated in cap and it's currently just a vacant parcel. Um, phase one, phase two, a record of decision and certificate of completion have all been completed. And this is a uh, zone for a waterfront district and its proposed use is also commercial or industrial. I've passed this site. It is on the left, best Dunkin' Donuts that most people stop at and then continue <laughs> on through Amsterdam. Um, so this was previously a strip mall and it housed multiple different things, but again, has been sitting vacant for about 10 years. Um, it is privately owned, although the city does have a TIO on the property and is ready to foreclose at any time. We're currently working in partnership with Montgomery County who received a Brownfield assessment grant. And this is one of the sites that is being tested right now. Um, so we'll have a better idea of what we're dealing with on this site. We're also looking at partnering with the county on demolition of this site so that if a developer is interested, we're able to move forward quickly once we realize what we're handling and need to remediate. Um, again, this is at a very busy intersection, one of the busy, busiest thoroughfares in the city of Amsterdam. Um, so the old paper mill exists on Forest Avenue right off of 67. This is currently owned by the city of Amsterdam. And once all the five corner site and is acquired, there's a, um, three parcels that merge together. So there's a potential to maybe do something in terms of a trail or walkability connection to have a property on Five Corners as well as a Forest Avenue site. Uh, old Paper Mill actually exists right off of the Chuckton Under Creek too. And there's a, a waterfall and old trestle right near that. So that's an opportunity for plans as well. This is a little bit larger site, five acre site. And uh, to the north of this is a um, city park that exists as well. Um, so right now we have, don't have any environmental studies that have been um, successfully done on this site. We're hoping that in the future we will be able to successfully receive an EPA grant that we can do brownfield assessments, this being one of our strategic sites. Um, but the overall goal is to have it tested, have it demolished, and then market it for some type of use, whether it's just straight commercial or again, mixed use, because further up Forest Avenue, is more of a residential um, area of the city. What I come away with when I listen to these site descriptions and explanations are just how many opportunities there are. There's so much access, so many things nearby. A lot of it because it came out of that very specific need to build a city, build a town around a specific purpose, around specific access. And like so many communities in upstate New York, there were huge disruptions to the local economy. Uh, here's John Pisick, CEO of the Herkimer County IDA, with just such an example. One of the things that I always thought was amazing in New York State is how much we go out to bid and how much product we get from other places than New York State. And when uh, Commissioner uh, Roanne Dostito was involved, I said to her, look, we don't have uh, very good meat processing in upstate New York. We don't have a facility. We, and what happens to our, our cows? They go to Pennsylvania, they get processed there, then they go to Cincinnati to be cooked, chilled, and then they come back to New York City schools and prisons. Most of that meat has traveled more than that student ever will. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's how we look at these. And I said to her, let's give a new company that wants to come in 20% of the business. They're, they're working for it anyways, they're providing a product, they have a way to start out, and, and that would help promote what we need to have done in the state. And I think that can happen in any one of these brownfields. You're bringing in a manufacturer, say they make train parts. We know we need train parts in New York State, Amtrak, CSX, everybody needs those. Work with the state, Remington Arms, or Rem Arms now. We know that New York State buys shotguns, uh, pistols for the, for the troopers, 
for different law enforcement. Let's work that out. Why are we so concerned about others? That was my response. That, well, that's what I got for a response. Well, we have to look at the bid process. Yes, we do, and New York should take a preference. So instead of giving us money, let's work with the companies that want to come here and help support them. So that would be one of the things that I would suggest. Now, to me, that says a lot about the value of refocusing on local economy. And John goes on to talk about the importance of community. We were very fortunate. The village of Billion stepped up and took over a property that everybody thought had a ton of hair on it. Thanks, Tom. That's one of his sayings. Is, and, and said, why should we touch this property? But as we start investigating and learn where it is and how we can get things cleaned up, but you have to keep that community involved. They, gotta be, they, they have to be okay to call you. You have to go in front of their, their town, their village, and say, this is what we see here. Here's the results of the testing. It's not as bad as we all thought, or this area is. What can we do to make it better? But I'll tell you, the village of Ilian really stepped up. This building was going to go in bankruptcy in a foreign firm. We never would have got it. And uh, there's been so much testing over the years, and now we have uh, drawings. I can't say renderings, because that's what happens in a meat processing house. <laughs> but we have, we have tons of drawings, and we have different things that, that'll, that'll make this building something that'll be very good for the community. Um, I think when you really promote the, the brownfield that you have and work with everybody that wants to work with you, you can truly succeed with it. We've had developers want the property. We're just not there yet. We want to make sure when we turn it over that it's the right thing to do at the right time. Um, I guess probably you know, we should have looked at the Brownfield cleanup program before, but maybe with some of the other money that we're going to receive in might equal out for us all. Um, we've done asbestos studies on it. We've done structural studies on it. Um, we've asked everybody for money from it. Even the uh, land bank gave us some money to do a study. So. You don't. You can't be afraid to ask, and you can't be afraid to work with your community. A lot of them, especially the the school board, I was concerned, but it hasn't really generated much tax over the years, and I, and we really thought it was important to sit down with them and let them understand what can happen there. The drawings of the property really do show some great things there: some additional housing, uh, some retail, a, a microbrewery. Um, bocce courts, uh, so it's in a marketplace to help uh, have farmers markets at during the summer. And then with that additional green space there, bringing in another manufacturer that can help support the area as well. Brownfields and community isn't just about a one-way street here. The value is reciprocal. Both parties see a huge benefit to this kind of redevelopment. These opportunities real is that unity of being stronger together and the way in which Everyone in the Mohawk Valley is working together to make this a reality. We identified a couple of sites that would work for our model. This is Ken Kearney, president of Kearney Realty and Development Group. Uh, Ron, working with uh, his board, was able to identify a site right off the of Main Street. We were trying to re we're trying to reconnect this part of downtown with Main Street. It was an area of downtown that was a little disconnected. You weren't getting the foot traffic anymore. Yeah, this is uh, the project in, in Poughkeepsie. This is on Main Street, but it was in a qualified census tract, an area of uh, po high poverty, and nobody was walking up and down on the sidewalk. So we built this. We built an 8,000 square foot brewery in the corner, built an elevator going up to a rooftop terrace with some of the best views in the Hudson Valley. So this model works, and we've uh, completed, we just finished our fourth project uh, with this model. Oneonta is under construction. Rome is under construction. Gloversville. I'm happy to report that two weeks ago, uh, I closed on the property with the Fulton County Center for Regional Growth, working with Ron, his staff, and uh, Mayor Vince. Um, and uh, we own the property. Uh, it's approved. It will be two phases of our model, 75 units first, and then another 75 later on. We've just submitted an application to HCR. Uh, so if anybody's listening, anybody here? Uh, we just submitted that uh, a week ago and uh, we're very excited. That's uh, Glove City Walls building. Very, very complex project, very complex. It's a brownfield, very serious contamination. Uh, we were able to get in on the National Register, um, but I fell in love with the atrium. Take a look at that atrium. That atrium exists. I just want to break in here because this atrium really is quite stunning and you can see some pictures of it in the video 
that we put out about the summit. But what makes these brownfield structures so special is so many of them preserve what's unique and interesting about the past of this region. These forgotten or neglected structures keep that beauty from a bygone era and show us that it's still there to reclaim. Okay, back to Ken. So I looked at it and I said, we're going to make the inside to look like, I'm sure you've all been on a cruise ship. I've not actually been on a cruise ship, but his point is valid here. Well, you look up, right, and, and you see um, everybody's cabin. Well, we're, do, we're doing that here with the art lofts, and we're going to create a park inside. That beauty is part of the strengths of this area, and sites like those are some of the strengths of the summit. Now, we're going to hear from Gene Hammerman from the Center for Creative Land Reuse on some of the other strengths of the area and of the summit. I just quickly want to just come up with six things that I um, think that the area has done well, right and could be emulated and, and would be a good reason for uh, developers to be interested in the area. First, they ask for help, number one. Um, you've got a team here of uh, redevelopment experts, probably the best in the state, the best in the country, John Pizik, who just walked in. There's never been a question he's not been ready and willing to either ask or to ask for help on. Um, and that's really uh, one of the best features of all six counties here. Second, as Kate mentioned, they work collaboratively. You'd have to go on and on thanking everybody because of the level of collaboration both within their counties and among the six counties that really uh, came together to put on this event. Uh, so that level of collaboration is really just a model for other parts of the state. Um, they've really developed an expertise in redevelopment. Um, as I said, they've educated themselves, they've um, asked questions, they've uh, really uh, lent themselves um, to really understand uh, the process. And lastly, they've raised money, um, as you both said, um, in support of these projects. So just to say, I'm really pleased to have been able to pitch it here um, and to really see this program come together and um, really feel the area is really ripe for success. And again, uh, we were able to come in and to support this with the help of the EPA. You know, I, I think the most important thing that we can do as municipalities is, is uh, you know, show you that we've got the capacity, right? Show you that we uh, have prepared, you know, as much as possible for your coming to town um, and try to try to create really good real estate. Is Christian Mercurio, Vice President of Planning and Development of the Mohawk Valley Economic Development Growth Enterprise Corporation on the most important things you can do as a municipality? A lot of our brownfield uh, properties and a lot of the neighborhoods adversely impacted by brownfields are not great real estate, right? So we do everything we can through public infrastructure and, you know, chipping away uh, at the issue to create that real estate that you guys could actually envision your, your project on. Um, and we like to instill some confidence that you can work with us, right? You know, uh, you can, you're going to come to town and we're not just going to leave you hanging. We're going to stay with you. Um, and that we're going to do everything we can to eliminate risk because all these projects are nothing but risk. So everything we can do to eliminate it, we will. Um, and those are all things that we do right in that kind of that run up to talking to a developer. Um, but I think uh, Ken and Kate have kind of validated that um, whether it's Gloversville, uh, Oneonta, Rome, we're real easy to work with. You know, we really, we, 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 we have the leadership in place, uh, whether it's Mayor DeSantis or Mayor Izzo, um, and we got teams in place that, you know, okay, a village may not have a planner, but guess who does? You know, CRG's got a downtown planner. Um, Mohawk Valley Edge has planners and economists and everybody who are kind of at your service. So we, we rally around each other in this region, and it's been a real pleasure to work with all the six counties. That kind of stronger together unity isn't the easiest thing to make happen. It takes a lot of hard work, and it's a big challenge. There's more than meets the eye, or more to us than meets the eye, right? So um, this is exactly what we're talking about right now. Um, but think about this. 83% of Americans live in urban centers. So what kind of people, like really, like what kind of people would like, you know, contaminate and set fire to their living room? and then just build an addition instead to go live in and play. You know what I mean? Like, this is what we're doing to our homes. So 
I, you know, like very emotional about this stuff. So like, uh, so, so it, it is important that we do everything we can to kind of like go back to that room and clean it up because this is where we live. This is where our kids are gonna live. Hopefully this is where our grand grandparents are gonna live. You know, New York State has the Brownfield tax credits, the Empire State Development Grant, uh, funding for New York Main Streets, the historic commercial property tax, tax credits, New York State Main Street, and then we have the EPA coming from the federal and the grants and things that they offer. You know, and then don't forget National Grid. You know, they're your distant cousin who offers grants for economic development to grow regional economies. So when you think about the Mohawk Valley, don't think of us as a small, inconsequential part of New York. Think of us as your friends, your family, and your partners. The Mohawk Valley is ripe for redevelopment and investment, and we are here, we are ready to collaborate, and we are ready to shine. That was Heather Devitt, Economic Development Specialist for the Mohawk Valley Economic Development District, on some of the unique opportunities available in New York State. So where do consultants like HRP fit into this? Uh, well, good morning. My name is Lisa Nagel with Alon Planning and Design. We're located in Saratoga Springs, New York. Uh, we work around the state, a uh, lot in the Mohawk Valley. We're here at the Mohawk Valley Brownfield Developer Summit, um, sponsoring the, the program. I'm a community planner, so I work with communities throughout the state, particularly the Mohawk Valley, to redevelop brownfields uh, with the New York State Brownfield Opportunity Area Program. So our company is in the beginning stages of analyzing an area, say two to 500 acres, looking at various properties within those acreages and identifying strategic sites. And say there's eight to 10 strategic sites within that area. And the focus is on redeveloping those sites to catalyze the redevelopment of the entire area. Um, it's a New York State funded program on an annual basis. And uh, we write the grants and then, also, then prepare what's called the nomination study. That nomination study goes to the Department of State and is approved by the Secretary of State. And when that happens, developers who are seeking redevelopment of brownfield sites can get an extra boost, boost in the tax credits uh, above and beyond what's available through the brownfield cleanup programs. It's an important program to bring vision and redevelopment to an area. Uh, but also potentially real money for redeveloping some key properties. So another thing we do is we work often with environmental engineers, in particular HRP associates. Uh, HRP is very adept at getting EPA grant money to do actual assessments and cleanup of brownfield properties. What happens in that case is working with the environmental engineers, they're assessing the potential contamination on our phase one and phase two environmental assessments. That information is fed to us in the planning process so that when we're looking at the reuse of the properties, it's based on a high level of reality in terms of the potential contamination that may be at the properties and where is it. So when we're looking to reuse the properties, we might stay away from you know, over in that corner where it might be more contaminated than the other area, or we know that the property could be remediated to a certain standard. So we look at that use, whether it's residential, commercial, or industrial, in terms of the reuse of that property. So the, 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 the combining of the EPA assessment or mediation dollars and the Brownfield Opportunity Area Program is really a home run for communities to really kind of advance revitalization in their communities. As an environmental engineering and consulting firm that also specializes in health and safety, HRP is positioned to help communities with the nuanced environmental challenges they face. Uh, a very clean industry, thousands of highly skilled workers, took uh, finished leather and made fine leather dress gloves out of it. But the tanning of the leather, the, the transition from a dead animal skin to a finished leather product was a very dirty industry. This is Vincent DeSantis, mayor of Gloversville. Keep an eye open for a YouTube video on HRP's channel about the city of Gloversville coming up soon. And so that's what's left. We've, we've left we're left with the scars of that of the tanning industry large swaths of our city that have been off limits to development and and now you know due to that you know our our fantastic consultants uh, hrp associates i can't say enough good about them uh, elon associates uh, labella uh, they have been just fantastic and, and, and due to their guidance i think 
we're at the point now where we're able to redevelop these sites. We're able to, to get the grant money that, uh, that, that makes these sites uh, attractive to developers now. How about a practical example of what that redevelopment can result in? In this building, there's two or three thousand, maybe four or five thousand electrical circuits in this entire building that provide all the power for the lights and provide the, the uh, power outlets and the switches, uh, on-off switches and everything else. Each and every one of you in this audience owns hundreds of billions to maybe a trillion or two electrical circuits in the form of every electronic device you use, whether it's a a refrigerator, your car, your computer, your television set have billions and billions and billions of nanotransistors made in film manufacturing on a silicon or a silicon carbide or a glass substrate and integrated into every product that we own that uses electricity. You could tear apart an ever-ready battery, cut it in half, and you'd find a little printed circuit board and a bunch of little integrated circuits in there that, that control the power flux of that battery and make it 20 or 30 percent more efficient than an ever ready battery of 20 years ago would be. So you probably didn't know that little factoid. So all of you are, uh, if you consider the cost of, of producing those, those devices, all of you are trillionaires in, the, in, in terms of the number of nanotransistors that you own. But our valley is driven by high value innovation driven industry. It is now, it will be in the future, and it always has been. Nanoelectronics is a good example. That's the semiconductor industry. That's all those little integrated circuits I mentioned. Uh, that industry represents a $600 billion revenue industry that powers the entire $2 trillion electronics industry. It is, by all counts, the most critical. The modern nanoelectronics industry is the, is the oil of the future in terms of um, the economy. And we here in upstate New York, we are very strong in R&D. I, I work at a, a, the Albany Nano Complex. $20 billion have been, been invested at that complex, the bulk of which is from industry. Thanks to Lamar Hill there, director of New York Creates. So just in case we have not yet made our argument about Stronger Together as the theme of this summit, want to leave you with a feel-good montage of all of our speakers thus far talking about the value of the valley and what an amazing place the Mohawk Valley is. I'm so proud to be a part of this. It's bringing together so many people. The networking alone is invaluable. You know, when you're talking to developers and people looking to invest into the community, it's about financials and if it makes sense and location. But I think really the X factor, you know, at least for Montgomery County, is the relationships that are cultivated. And the thing that I really want people to know, especially the developers, is that, you know, we're not only redeveloping these sites, the redevelopment of these sites is part of a much broader redevelopment of an entire city. A reinvention, a renaissance of a former industrial city to a post-industrial, 21st century, flourishing community, walkable, livable, you know, ready for the 21st century and a 21st century economy. And it's been a tremendous just success story over the past few years. Uh, you know, we've all, we're all almost family at this point. Um, and that really, I think, resonates with you know, not only the EPA, the DEC, the Department of State, but the developers and engineers and geologists and everybody that are here today. And I've traveled five million miles. I've been uh, every continent on the planet other than Antarctica. And I've been to most every major metropolitan city in, in the world. And I would have to say that the quality of life here in upstate New York that we all enjoy is as, as fine as any place else on the planet. When I, when I see a picture like that and, and see the possibilities for redevelopment, uh, for a regeneration, a rebirth of literally the places that I love, I get very excited about it. We have great public education. We have mature and ready infrastructure. We have land, land, land. We have real estate with manufacturing heritage. We have cultural recreation and culinary excellence. And there's no better place on the planet.
So the value of the valley is, we live in the finest place on the planet. You're right, the Mohawk Valley is a great place to live. It's a great place to thrive with your family. It's also a great place to do business. And we, we, are, we are living, living in a dream location. We all recognize that, but we have to get out and I guess push our Mohawk Valley to its next level. I think they've really got a great, you know, a great forum to get to know us. And I think, you know, these are like little steps, you know, to, toward getting where, where we want to go and we're all well on our way. Perfect location. We should take advantage of that. We've got cutting edge locations for serving most metropolitans in the United States and the day's drive. We've got to take advantage of that. Thank you all for attending and we hope to see you again and make this an annual event for next year. Thank you very much. All right, folks, that's going to do it for the work hard section of 312 and for our coverage of this year's Mohawk Valley Summit. Today you heard the voices of Jack Spaeth, Ron Peters, John Pesek, Vincenzo Nicosia, Ken Kearney, Gene Hammerman, Christian Mercurio, Vincent DeSantis, Lamar Hill, Stephen Smith, and Lisa Nagel. Stick around, as always, for the Play Hard section. Got a special one for you. Don't forget, if you're out there listening, Play Hard section is available as a video podcast. So head to our YouTube channel if you want to get a look at where we are for this episode. All right, folks, welcome to the Play Hard section of the 312 podcast. Welcome, welcome. You've been listening to the Brownfield Summit, but we are back in Connecticut, not in Farmington, but in Derby, Connecticut, this time at Bad Sons Brewing, which is directly behind us. In addition to having some fantastic beer, they're also a former Brownfield site. And in addition to that, back behind that tree over there is HRP's Derby office. Second floor. Mm -hmm. So this area is a really great example of what a Brownfield site can become after remediation when you've got uh, businesses lined up and when you can turn it into a really excellent community space, as I'm sure all of these people here could tell you. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, I think it's kind of a trend now where you see, uh, you know, these old uh, industrial facilities that are like getting, uh, you know, a, a new breath of life put into them and, and you're seeing uh, like breweries and, and I, I think breweries are kind of a perfect thing to put in an old industrial building. Oh yeah. All the, everything's in the tanks, everything's clean and everything, you know, it's all above ground and it's, so mm -hmm. yeah. I want to hit them all. Yeah. Is that, is that a bad thing? Live from Houston, Texas. Well, not live for you because it's recorded, <laughs> but live for us, Everett Anderson from Houston, Texas, former resident of the cult building. Uh, Everett, can you tell us um, how cool it was to live in cult while you were there? Uh, it was, it was great. It was my first, it was my first apartment out of college. So it was a, it was a cool place to live. It was high ceilings and, you know, it was everything you kind of look for when you're like, oh, you know, I'm going to get my cool rustic apartment. Definitely had a, a unique charm to it. It wasn't not, I wouldn't say it start, it was starting to kind of change, but it was, it was definitely in the middle of that. Um, I, I'm sure now it's, it's, you know, completely different. I, they, you know, they renovated all those other buildings around it, and it was a uh, like a a sign of all the good things to come for Hartford. I think that's really true of a lot of those brownfield sites. Is that they're like the first step into like a really significant improvement and development within the community. That seemed to be true of Hartford, and I feel like that's true of a lot of those places where those brownfields get developed. Like for Colt, you know, if you drive a 91 every day to go to work, you drive by it every single day to go through Hartford. So it's it's this big giant building with a big blue dome and you can't really miss it. Um, and it's one of those things where it's kind of cool for, you know, anyone that has driven through Hartford, whether they live in Maine or live in New Jersey, I feel like you could be like, hey, yeah, I live in that, you know, the big blue dome. You're like, oh, yeah, I know that building. Like, it's, I feel like it's a very, it's a, it's a landmark, really. Yeah. Oh, it's definitely a landmark. All right. Well, I think that kind of covers what we wanted to hit on here. It looks like it's time for another round, too. I'm um, sorry, folks. I'm empty. I'm, I think it's time for Bubba to go. Well, we did want to give you another look at um, <laughs> how amazing a brownfield site can become once that it does get redeveloped and what that can hold in the future for those sites that we were talking about in the earlier part of the podcast. But thanks for joining us, everybody. 
Uh, if you liked it, make sure to rate, subscribe, do all the good stuff. Leave a review. It really helps us out, Hit guys. Hit that bell. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will see you in the next one. Stay safe out there, everybody. Take care, Bye. everybody.